Great. Uh, just want to welcome you. We're going to talk about criminal law today. Uh, I'm going to break this lecture in uh, two parts because of the, the length of the amount of material that's here. So this uh, first portion uh, we'll cover through. Um, we'll talk about some background to criminal law and our system, uh, why we have criminal law, what the rationales for that are, the different types of, uh, uh, of crimes, uh, uh, criminal intent, and then criminal procedure, and the second part we'll pick up um, after that. So, um, by way of introduction, these are the I'll put all these up here, and we can talk about them. These are the again the, the main parts of this chapter that uh, need you need to focus on, and uh, that I'll discuss. Um, we should be able to come up with a definition of crime, uh, how our criminal law system is working, uh, how the what it, what the function of it is here uh, currently, and. Uh, um, Later on in the chapter, we'll discuss certain specific elements of key crimes. Our criminal law is primarily founded on statutory authority, so you can look up in the criminal code in, in virtually every state uh, in the country, and federal. there's federal uh, criminal uh, legislation as well, and the statute spells out the elements of each crime. So you may be found uh, um, not guilty of a specific crime, but uh, there might be other elements in it that, that are a lesser sentence or lesser crime that might be a... a allotted to a person, okay? So there's different aspects, different key elements to every one of the crimes that are listed. If you're not found guilty of a particular crime, it may be that um, the some of the uh, other elements appear in, a, in another statutory um, definition of what a different crime would be, okay? Uh, we'll briefly talk about criminal procedure and uh, our uh, U.S. system of, of criminal procedure, and uh, and then that's that system of, cr of criminal procedure is, is uh, founded clearly in our U.S. Constitution. So we'll talk about some of the constitutional protections that are there, which we covered in the chapter on like, on the Constitution, but not as uh, as detailed as we will here. So, all right. So what is crime? Uh, I'll give you a couple textbook definitions. Um, this first uh, textbook definition is, is talking, really relating to the, the common good of society and when uh, someone behaves in a way that um, we would consider to be um, beyond the, the bounds of, of what the common good for society is. Um, it's offensive, it's objectionable, it's harmful to, to other people, then, then um, we consider that to be crime. So um, the common good is, is obviously pretty gray, but we, were, we recognize that somebody coming up in a, in a bar and punching someone else in the face is not the way we want society to, to um, take place, so there would be the crime of assault and battery most likely in that type of case because we want to dissuade uh, people from acting that way. Another definition, which I think is interesting, that puts the puts a little bit more. Um, it's other than this sort of nebulous idea of what the common good is. It, it basically suggests that we have, uh, like we did in torts, when you talk about negligence, that we have a a, a duty to treat others uh, in a way that isn't harmful. And so, uh, if we breach that duty, we break that duty, then there's going to be a consequence. And um, typically, under criminal law, that that most often we think of as jail time. Um, it may be someone's life it's a, if it was a capital crime that was committed, and it may be a fine if it's a, a more minor crime. So, in this uh, definition, basically, you're talking focusing more on what the duty that each of us owes um, to society, and not breaking um, that duty uh, of harm to others. All right. So, um, move on to the next slide here. This often is uh, our misunderstanding of what the law is, and, and not that these shows are necessarily bad, or these, this is a video game here, this um, true crime New York City thing down here in the bottom right corner, but um, we often have our, our, our views of the criminal justice system that's a little bit biased um, um, because of the, the popularization of a lot of these crime scenes, like CSI type of, of and law and order types of, of shows. So this, uh, just by way of giving you some background, some um, statistical background, there's a lot of information on the slide, but um, you see in the top left one, it talks about the incarceration rate of, of inmates that are in the state and federal system and, and the population. The very top uh, line is the number of, of uh, males. The bottom one, the green there, is female, and, and the, the rate of incarceration. So you can see from 1925 to 2006, particularly from the late 1970s on, the uh, number of people in prisons has really just gone bonkers. Um, our overall crime rate... Um, as you see, crimes per 100,000 people actually, um, since the 1960s, has it, it risen by 
but um, it, it's actually gone down, as you see, from 1990 up to 2000. This isn't current statistics, but and then at the bottom, if you look at the the uh, bottom chart, violent crime since 1998 to 2008 has really stayed pretty much the same. So we have to ask, where are all these uh, people? You know, what what types of uh, crimes are people getting? Um, arrested for a why why is this huge blossoming of, of uh, people in prison since you know roughly 1975 or so uh, where is that coming from and a big portion of this if you look at it is coming from the war on drugs so I would ask you these questions and and have you take a guess um, uh, first uh, in the war on drugs it's gone on 41,100 uh, were the number of people were in prison for drug related offenses in 1980 what would you guess that number would be today the number today is a half a million um, and um, you had a total uh, a total number of prisoners in the entire US prison and jail system in 1980 was 300,000 now you have 500,000 in prison today roughly 500,000 that are just in for drug related offenses um, 300,000 was the total number, like I said, uh, were in prison in the U.S. prisons in 1980 and today. Um, that number, total number, is over 2 million um, in, in total number. And by the end of, this is another statistic, I guess, by the end of 2000, the number will be greater than 7 million. Um, and this is 2007, so I'm looking at some older statistics. But uh, that's one of every 31 adults will be in jail pro on probation or on parole. Um, Germany in uh, the number of in prison in Germany is 93 per 100,000 um, and in the US uh, our number again here uh, I just give you this and well one in every 31 adults and let's see if I had the statistic in US uh, um, that number is 750 per 100,000 um, population uh, so for 700 people are imprisoned for every 100,000 of population in our country, which is greater than Russia or China or Iran. Um, the vast majority of people who are in prison then are obviously related to drug types of crimes. And often our, uh, the myth that's here is we believe that uh, the people that are in prison then must be these big drug pin, uh, kingpins, and they're the ones who are selling heroin and all the hard drugs. And the fact of the matter is uh, they're not. Uh, the drug kingpins and the big dealers are not the ones who are in prison. Um, uh, this is a statistic from 2005. Uh, roughly 80% of all arrests were for pose possession. Um, and only 20% were for sales. Um, the possession um, crimes are, were pr primarily related to marijuana possession. That's 80, there's an 80% growth in, in drug arrests in that 1990s and uh, into 2000, um, and primarily that's for marijuana possession. So um, uh, we have to ask some questions about what we're doing in society when this is the the primary um, function of our criminal justice system obviously we don't want to have violent crime but you saw the statistics for since the 1960s violent crime has stayed you know fairly comparable where we've seen the blossoming of prison population is here in the war on drugs it's just uh, this it begs some questions of us and how the system is operating I'm going to throw a lot more statistics at you I apologize but this next slide deals with the issue of race and we cannot talk about criminal justice in our system uh, in, in the United States without talking about the war on drugs and without talking about race there's a phenomenal book I would recommend to you uh, it's called the new Jim Crow and it's written by a woman named Michelle Alexander who um, has meticulously documented this issue of race and crime in our um, country and um, how it predominantly f affects people of color and particularly african-american men in this country and so uh, these are statistics from her book and uh, it's like I said it's really worth um, taking a look at it again Michelle Alexander uh, the new Jim Crow is the book and here's some statistics again people of color 43 percent of all the executions since 1976 um, and people of color are 55 percent of those currently awaiting execution so um, again I'm not, I don't mean to read this to you but you can read this but um, more than half of the people who are um, uh, on death row are um, of people of color uh, and then you see white victims are approximately half of all the murder victims 80 percent of all capital cases involve white murder so um, this is uh, if you look at this the percentage of, of um, 
um, jurisdictions that have the highest uh, number of minorities who are on death row. Death row, again, for those of you who might not be familiar, we're talking about people who have a, uh, are charged with a capital um, offense, so the capital uh, capital meaning the death penalty for their case. They, their case might be on appeal, and um, so they are uh, primarily um, in, a, in a special uh, cell block in prisons. Uh, here you can see, again, the highest minority, uh, minority rates of people on death row. 86% in the U.S. military. Um, here's Colorado, um, our U.S. government, other uh, federal um, prisons, the state of Louisiana, the state of Pennsylvania. Um, when 70% or 70, 80% of, of who is on death row um, are African Americans or people of color, we have to ask some, some questions about that and why that's, why that's the case. Um, statistically, the United States puts in prison a percentage of, African Ameri of the African American population that is uh, greater than what South Africa did during the peak of, of uh, apartheid in the system that they had. And what this means in some areas, here's an example for you, in places like Washington, D.C., three out of uh, every four um, young African-American men in Washington, D.C. are sometime in their life can expect to serve time in prison. So what does that all mean? Um, when uh, the system, the system uh, aims more towards... Uh, uh, if we were talking about true, fair, uh, equ an equal system, we have to be a little careful when we, and of course we can debate this, and people can say statistically, you know, you can make statistics say a lot of, a lot of things, but it's kind of hard to, to um, support on death row in particular how there are so many more people of color who are on death row by percentage, and, and these are just some example jurisdictions. Um, you know, um, they're, they're clearly not the only ones committing violent crime, and yet a uh, very uh, disparate number you're seeing uh, people of color uh, being the ones who are on death row. So we have to ask some, some questions about that. I think it's just, just appropriate to, to discuss that. Um, let's see. Um, I, this next slide is interesting to me, and uh, again, maybe it's because my wife and I have been going through this process of having a baby, and we, the issue is a little bit closer to us um, than maybe a lot of folks who aren't going through that right now. But I want to suggest, and maybe this is off the wall for some of you, might really dis dispute this with me, but I want to suggest what we consider to be crime. How do we define crime? We, we've gotten to some sense of it already, and, and you know when you're when there's something that is uh, someone behaves in a way that is beyond um, what we would expect uh, from a, a you know how people should behave in society, and it's uh, not acceptable behavior. Uh, that's one thing. But what about our society that is is um, locking up people or having people on death row by virtue of uh, with some racial discrimination? What about a society that is um, has, like you see here, California, um, the United States, uh, we're talking about maternal, maternal mortality rate. What that means is women who die giving birth, while giving birth in the United States. Um, how is it uh, that in a, a technologically advanced um, country, we can have um, uh, women dying while giving birth that is uh, at such an absolutely exorbitant rate in comparison to um, other countries, other developed countries, um, what you see here looking at California was as high as 16.9, um, um, and this is uh, a number of women who die while giving birth, uh, so 16.9 per 100,000. The national average, um, not average, but you can see the primarily the United uh, the the nation ra nation's rate has been uh, lower than this all along. Um, than, than California, uh, but regardless, both the United States and the state of California have a rate of, of, of maternal deaths per 100,000 that are well exceeding um, even developing countries, some very poverty-stricken countries, um, some through Central America and other places, that, uh, Africa even, that we, um, are, we have women who die at a higher rate while giving birth than um, those nations. And so I, 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 it might be stretching it, but I, we want to ask, as a society, we need to be critical of, of um, 
or at least critically examine what we do and uh, and how we treat our citizens. Is it in the common good to have mothers die while giving birth to a child? It seems absolutely crazy. Is it a crime? Of course it's not. Uh, we don't legislate it as a crime, but there's something almost criminal about a society that um, would let that sort of thing happen. So just food for thought as to how we broadly define what crime is, and, and it is a, sort of a, it is aimed in a, a sort of a sociological way that we should be looking at, at um, criminal law because we're trying to um, dissuade certain types of behavior. We want certain things not to happen in our society, and so we have law that's aimed at trying to, to um, uh, deter that behavior is, is one element of it. So I mentioned at the top of this uh, of this lecture that um, criminal law is fi primarily, American criminal law is primarily based in statutory authority. So where do we look for these things, uh, the evidence of, of uh, what is criminal law? We look at, at primarily at the statute itself, and this is, in most states is in the form of a penal code, and um, the penal code basically will spell out what the act is, whatever it is that we're going to call a crime, and also the penalty that, that uh, should be imposed for that crime. And uh, our next real question related to this is, is what's the reason for this? And some people have really challenged this. Why do we have a criminal, um, you know, criminal code at all uh, on one level? Uh, 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 what is it? What are we trying to do with it? We can't really legislate um, morality. We want people to act a certain way and follow our values, what we generally accept in society. But we certainly, and, and passing a law isn't going to stop someone from committing, committing murder, for example. The point of the law it could be on lots of lots of aspects of it. One could be um, purely d deterrence, and uh, so we want to deter people from acting in a socially unacceptable way. In the old days, you can see the the stockade type thing that's out here in front of the the building. Somebody would put their head in their arms through the holes, and then they would be shackled in there, and they'd have a sign around their neck or something that would say that this is the behavior they had done something wrong, they had stolen something, and so people would spit on them or throw things at them and whatever, and and it was uh, aimed at deterring um, bad behavior. Another reason for the statutory authority may be to, to uh, prevent um, families or victims, uh, victims or friends of the victims from trying to, to act as a vigilante, essentially, to go in and take their own revenge against someone. And you can see this picture. This is a reenactment of what used to be done in the old days, uh, early col colonial times, where people would pour tar, hot tar on someone uh, who they believed had done something wrong, and then they would uh, pour feathers on them. And again, a, a way of humiliating, uh, but also family members might have gathered and done this. And so this is a, a way that the statutory authority today is aimed at trying to stop that from taking place. Something that had been done a lot more in the 70s, uh, we focused on this for a while with criminal um, cases, we started thinking uh, broadly about the cycle of people uh, going in and going back in again, the recidivist or repeat offenders, which we have a problem with that today too, obviously. And uh, the point being, if someone commits a crime because maybe they have uh, a drug addiction and they and they need help um, with that addiction, they go into prison. They're not getting any help with that. They come back out and they still have their addiction, and they go back to to robbing or doing whatever to get the money to pay for their drug. So. In the 1970s, there's a lot more influence on this. We're starting to talk more again about this issue because, as, as uh, statistics will show you, um, those who have a, a felony conviction uh, and are imprisoned for that felony conviction, um, once they get out, they are back in the prison system typically within 18 months. 66, 65% or so uh, of felony convicted uh, folks end up back in the, in the criminal justice system again within 18 months. So should we not work on trying to have uh, criminal codes that have a uh, built-in aspect that is trying to aim towards rehabilitating these folks? And there's something to be said about that and whether we should should uh, have statutory authority that, that aims at that. Another aspect of our criminal justice system and the statutory authority for it is just to have somebody off the streets. So we, they're not out harming someone else, so we incapacitate them for a period of time. and. So they lose their freedom um, because uh, we're trying to protect the rest of society. Okay. So next thing I want to talk about is different class classification of crimes. There's uh, three different broad, very broad types of crime, crimes that we have in our system. And the first one you may be very familiar with when we talk about term, we talk about felony, and felony is the most serious type. 
the Latin term for this we talk about is mala in se. Mala in se means bad in and of itself. Just the, the very th nature of this thing is it's, it's bad and evil. Um, it's, you know, an inherently evil thing. We're, we're talking about things like um, murder and rape, burglary, where you sneak into someone's house and break in and take something, um, those types of things. Um, so typically that's what we're talking about when we talk about uh, felony crime. It's inherently evil just by the nature of what it is. So the, in most jurisdictions, this means there's a, the penalty typically is at least one year in prison or more. And uh, and depending on, they have also degrees. So um, if you have something that's aggravated felony case, then you're using a weapon or you're very violent in, in the commission of that crime, you may have uh, a more serious degree and a more serious uh, penalty or, or punishment that goes along with that. Okay. The next group of um, crimes, uh, less serious, are called misdemeanors. And these are not inherently evil. We call them mala prohibita. They're, you know, society, our, our statutory authority pr prohibits them. Uh, they're not inherently evil, but they're, they're prohibited because uh, society thinks that they're not good things. And in this case, they're not so serious, so we typically, um, they're not in jail as long if you do go to jail at all. And you may even just have a, a fine that goes with, with that. Um, uh, type of a crime. So this is, um, you know, misdemeanor. Somebody's in a, um, they're uh, walking with open alcohol in, in Pioneer Square or something, or, or they have a small amount of marijuana and they're walking around and they have that. That might be considered a misdemeanor. It's not as serious a crime as, as a murder, obviously, and so the penalty is going to be less. The third type of crime, although we often don't think of them this way because, you know, we just, uh, received the infraction. They're called infractions or they're violations, sometimes called citations. And um, they're neither felonies, they're not felony, they don't come into either of the other two um, categories. And they're, you know, often here's an example, things like traffic violations. You know, you are jaywalking, so the light is red and you're a pedestrian and you walk against the light. Um, you, you don't wear your seatbelt, you don't wear your, your motorcycle helmet. Those types of things would be traffic violations. You're speeding. Um, you're going 45 in the 35 mile hour zone. You get a ticket. The ticket is technically, uh, um, even though it might come under vehicle code, it's, uh, it may also be considered, most often it's considered a crime as well. And what's the penalty in the end? Typically, uh, there's a fine involved. Uh, if you do this in certain states, uh, that uh, you have multiple traffic violations, you, it may affect your insurance rates and things. So it, uh, more often than not, is a, it's not a, a jail sentence that comes with us in any way. It's typically paid in a fine. So, um, all right. The next thing we get to is uh, we're going to talk about intent in a criminal setting. And in this case, um, particularly, they're just a – let you have some background from our, our, our old English common law. There, there are typically two things that appear in criminal cases. Okay, um, we have what's called the Latin term actus reus, which is a guilty act. So, um, the the you, you do something that that was a, a wrongful act. Um, your conduct uh, today, how we do this instead of by common law, sort of uh, com uh, common law custom, uh, that, oh, of course, this was a guilty act. Uh, someone else had committed this in the past. Uh, and so we're, today you, you did this thing that was not like someone else had done in the past. Then we would call that a common law custom type of thing. But today our conduct, the circumstances that you're in it, the results that's occurred by your act, these are, might come from common law in the sense of our case law, uh, to define it. But more often than not, as you know, uh, this guilty act that you've committed is going to be defined in the statute. Um, uh, or it may be failure to act is the other aspect of this. It might be a guilty act or a failure to act when you should have acted. Uh, that, that is the first part of what's in the crime. The other part is, having a guilty mindset and um, we typically refer to that as intent and with, uh, when we get to this what we're really talking about in criminal intent there's a couple different types of intent okay so the, the first type is called general intent um, you intend to do this act but you don't intend the result so um, remember we talked about this in torts uh, someone is walking down a pier uh, with some friends, and they give their friend a shove on the shoulder, and um, the person falls over the, the railing, and they fall down, and they get really badly injured. Well, in tort, you're looking for money damages for that. And in tort, we would call it negligence um, because you had a duty of care, and you uh, breached your duty of care. The person was harmed, and they have, they have damages that were caused by your breach of the duty of care to them. 
in crimes, um, you clearly didn't intend to have this person be really badly hurt. Um, you did a push, so you intended to act, and you shouldn't do this. We would agree in society, you shouldn't do this thing. Uh, you intended it, but you didn't, cause, you didn't intend to cause the harm. We call that general intent. So you didn't intend that uh, harm to happen to the person, but uh, you did intend the act. There's no question about that. The other type of intent we see in criminal law is called specific intent. So not only did you intend to do the thing that was prohibited, you also intended the actual harm. So in this type of situation, I didn't just shoot a gun at you to scare you. Um, I shot a gun at you because I was trying to actually harm you, and I did. I actually shot you in the arm, let's say. So I intended to do a prohibited act. We could probably call that attempted murder. Um, and I actually got the harm that I wanted. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, th that's what we call that specific intent. Now you can imagine what the sentence is going to be like in the first case versus the second case. The sentence typically where you don't intend the result but you still intended the act, the penalty for that is going to be less. In a specific intent case, uh, you intended the act and you intended the harm. Typically those cases you're going to ab absolutely get a, a, a more harsh penalty for, for what you've done. Okay. Something I really want to caution you on though here is please don't confuse this term, criminal intent, with this word, motive. Um, motive is why someone does something, the why they act or why they, why they fail to act. So uh, the person shot at someone else, um, they may have done it because they thought it was out of self-defense. Um, that's the reason, the motive of why they shot at somebody. They may rob a bank because they, you know, they have a motive, they need to pay for uh, um, somebody who's sick that they have to get money for or whatever. There's a, that's the reason. That's what motive is. That's different from intent where you actually intend the act. Um, you are purposefully trying to, to commit an act. Um, it's, so it's very different from the reasoning behind why you did it. And that's, that's motive. All right. So, um, all right. Next we step into the area of uh, criminal procedure. And my professors in law school professor who taught criminal law might be a little fussy with me that I boil it down this way, but um, I'm really going to give you the nutshell way of looking at criminal procedure, and it's um, uh, uh, it's it's a simple, truly, it, the whole process of getting to trial, if there's going to be a criminal trial, it goes A, B, C, D, and um, it's a really easy way to memorize this, and uh, uh, so here we go. So, uh, and again, I'll put all these up here, and you don't, don't, worry about writing notes or anything on all this. I, I will go through each one of these individually. But the arrest is the A. B is booking. C are the charges. And the charges can come in the form of a, a grand jury indictment or the charges could come in uh, in a less serious case in, as what's called a magistrate's information or a judge's information. It's an actual document. And so that's A, B, C, and then the D, I kind of cheat a little bit here, is the defendant's arraignment. So the arraignment is actually what we get to, and but to make the A, B, C, D, I put defendant in there first because the arraignment is going to be of the defendant. So let's start with arrest. So here's a arrest, an arrest taking place. Typically what we're talking about with an arrest is the police detain somebody and it's, they're detaining someone in a way that um, no reasonable person would believe that they're free to leave in the situation. So that doesn't necessarily mean that someone has handcuffs on them. If this person wasn't getting handcuffed and say uh, there's a driver um, who was driving who may have been intoxicated, the police stopped them and this is the passenger and this guy is not getting handcuffed but he's told he can't leave. Um, what if he does take off running? Um, or if he says before he even takes off running, he says, am I under arrest? And the police officer says no. Uh, would it be reasonable for him to think that if he took off running, it would be okay? And obviously the answer would be no. So technically this person could be under arrest without having handcuffs on if reasonably it could be seen that this person wasn't free to leave. Now there's a lot of gray area in this, and and the police officers may dispute this too with me, I'm sure. But uh, the the basic textbook definition of an arrest means that you are detained, and a reasonable person would believe that you are detained in a way that doesn't um, doesn't allow you to leave the the premises of wherever you're at. Okay, if you ask to leave and they say no, um, and you ask, uh, "Am I under arrest?" and they say no, then am I free to leave? No, then. Uh, Chances are technically under the law, you are technically being detained and you should uh, be considered to be under arrest. 
typically, not always, obviously, an arrest warrant is needed to actually arrest someone. Uh, this is a constitutional protection we'll talk more about. But um, what that means is uh, the police have to believe that they have probable cause, good reason to uh, arrest a person. Uh, this person was uh, drunk driving, um, and the, the officer witnessed it. They were weaving across the, the um, highway. When they're stopped, they breathe in a certain way. Um, you know, they breathe, uh, they smell of alcohol. The police officer can arrest them. So there, there's obviously, we'll go on the next slide here, there's obviously times when a police officer doesn't need to have an actual arrest warrant. But typically, uh, the key component is having probable cause or good reason to arrest someone. In that case, if the police have good reason to arrest someone, they go to a judge, they ask for an arrest warrant, the judge issues a piece of paper and says, yes, I've seen evidence, it looks like um, you have appropriate evidence as to, to arrest this person, and then the police go arrest that person. And again, um, there are several situations where that doesn't have to happen. Um, arrest without a warrant is okay. I'll put all these up here. Um, you know, obviously, if an officer arrives during a crime, uh, they come up to a bank and there's somebody running out with, uh, you know, with money flying behind them, and somebody says, "Stop that person!" They rob the bank. The police don't obviously; they do not obviously have to go to a judge and get a warrant. They can arrest someone there. Someone's fleeing the scene um, when they believe evidence is likely to be destroyed. Um, the, basically, if the officer believes or has probable cause, good reason to believe that someone has committed or is committing a crime, then they have reason, justification to arrest that person. In most other cases, um, police need to get a, a warrant in order to do that. Okay, so that's A, arrest. And why does it matter? Because every police show you've ever seen, you heard about these magic two words, Miranda rights. Once someone's under arrest, they have to be given the Miranda, their Miranda rights. Uh, it happened with a case of Miranda um, versus the state of Arizona. So I think it's a 1960s um, case. Um, and, and in that case, um, um, essentially, what you, what you hear, you know, you, you have a right to, to remain silent. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't have one, if you can't afford one, one will be appointed for you. Uh, all those types of things. That's again to ensure your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So, um, the when you are under arrest, you are by law now required. The police are required to read your, your Miranda rights, and that's why it's significant to determine whether there's an arrest or not in a particular situation. Okay, so now we're at B. So A was arrest. B is booking. Um, booking used to be that formerly there was a really thick, gigantic book in the police station when the, the defendant got brought in and they put all this information in here. They recorded your arrest by um, fingerprinting you. Um, they recorded your arrest by um, taking your photograph and then they put this all in a, in a big gigantic book and so that's what they called it booking. Um, now you know it's all electronically done so the, the, the fingerprints and the photo and all that are all um, entered into a database and, and so there's uh, statistical ways and, and all this, there are ways to, to track all, all this right uh, by, by electronic fashion but booking is, is the B. C is charging. So the defendant now um, uh, is in jail. They may or may not know what they've been charged for, and so they uh, are, are going to be formally accused of whatever crime it is they're, they're, um, they've been, they're going to be charged with. And so the police are the ones who write the initial police report. They're the ones who technically start this process. They hand off their police reports to the district attorney's office or a prosecutor's office who then starts looking into the case a little bit more and deciding whether this case should go forward, um, whether they should uh, try to, to, to actually prosecute or whether there's not enough evidence or whether the police did something wrong in the investigation that would prohibits going forward uh, for a trial, and so the, the charging component is there. And um, so what's happening is the prosecutor or district attorney, whatever their title is, basically is going to make this determination as to whether they, they move forward, uh, you know, if, they, um, if it's worth going forward with a case or not. In a um, more serious case, serious crimes, um, uh, it may be that uh, an indictment is issued, and uh, indictment is uh, is uh, is for like I said, is, is formally charging the defendant for a serious crime. Um, a grand jury is uh, is not a, a jury like we think of as a jury that's determining innocence or guilt. A grand jury is called, and they deal with serious cases. 
and they are just determining whether there's enough evidence that raises questions whether this person should be held over for a trial or not. That's all the grand jury is doing. In a serious case, they're doing that. If it's not such a serious case, it's not a murder or something to that effect, a magistrate or another type of judge will issue a document called an information. And the information is basically um, saying the same kind of thing, not guilty or innocent, but that this person should be held over for a trial to determine uh, if there's, uh, you know, if some, if a crime has actually in fact been committed, right? So that's, that's the ultimate question that's happening here. Is there enough evidence to hold the defendant over for a trial? And if yes, there is, um, otherwise they set the person free. Um, if there is enough evidence, then we get to D. So A is arrest, B is booking, C are the charges. Defendant now has a right to know what the formal charges are that are being brought against him or her. And so there's a, this uh, defendant's arraignment. The arraignment is actually a formal hearing. The, the uh, defendant is brought into the courtroom, and the defendant is read what the charges are, and then the defendant is asked, you know, what, do you, what plea do you enter? Are you guilty? Are you not guilty? Or do you, do you plead no contest or no low contendere? And so um, if, depending on that plea, again, um, that's uh, how the case will, will proceed. If, if you say guilty, um, there will probably be some um, sort of um, element of trying to uh, resolve the case by way of plea bargain, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, if you say not guilty, then you're requesting that a trial be held, and the, the court will then issue a date as to when the trial will um, um, processes of the trial will begin. Or if you, you say no contest, um, what you're basically doing in a no, no contest, no low, low contendere case is you are saying, I'll accept the penalty, but I'm not admitting that I'm guilty. And so um, <laughs> this might sound odd. Why would you do this? And in some cases, maybe someone is a public official and they don't want to have the, the press uh, all over this case. And so they'll take a, a penalty, but they, they're not admitting that they're guilty. Um, so then there won't be a big trial and it won't be all publicized and, and they'll take some some form of punishment. The thing of it is, though, the government gets to decide whether this is acceptable or not. So the government can say, no, we want a trial. And, they, and the, the state or the whatever jurisdiction we're talking about, the government can say, I'm sorry, um, we're, we want a full-blown trial and we will not accept this, um, this uh, no contest plea. All right? So at this point, if... Uh, there is going to be a trial. The defendant can request to post bail, and depending on the crime, if this is a, um, we, we've got the Green River Killer, who we believe is the Green River Killer, who's a serial killer or something, and we believe he's the defendant that's 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 asking for being posting bail. Um, most likely, in those cases, the person will not be allowed to do that. Posting bail basically means you put up a certain amount of money. Um, the court is trying to ensure that you will show up for the day of trial. So. Um, Basically, what this means, if you are a risk of, of fleeing the area, if you are a risk uh, potentially of, uh, you know, this is a serial killer that's finally been caught, they believe most likely the, either the bail will be set very high, or which you won't be able to afford to, to pay, uh, or there will not even be allowed uh, a bail. And so bail, essentially, again, what you're doing is the defendant is asking to be allowed out of jail until uh, the, the case has uh, actually had a, a, a trial that's taken place. Now, some of these cases you, where people can post bail, you'll have uh, cases like the Bernie Madoff case or something where someone's alleged to have uh, embezzled or taken millions of dollars from investors. They will often be able to get bail. They pay money, uh, sort of like insurance, in order to, uh, to ensure that they'll show up on the day of the trial, and they, put, they have to put that money up. So whatever the bail is set at, typically it's, um, I, I believe it's at least 10% that, that the the defendant has to come up with. So if a million dollars was the bail, that means you have to have $100,000 of something of value that the court can attach that would hold you to that, at least $100,000 um, that would do that. All right. So uh, it may get to this point, too, then you might have some plea bargaining. So rather than going forward with a whole trial, um, the uh, prosecuting attorney believes that they could charge you, you know, you with murder or they have multiple different crimes they could charge the defendant with. And so um, rather than going through a whole trial, they might say, um, 
how about if we try to bargain and work out something that's a lesser included uh, offense or a lesser included crime than, than murder? And um, the defense might balk at this or the defense might be asking for it. Uh, and the prosecuting attorney might want to go forward with a trial. But there is this option of plea bargaining, which some people might find very offensive. But the purpose of this is to save court time and money. And even sometimes uh, victims, uh, family members uh, don't want to have go through more of the agony of a whole trial. And sometimes if, they, if you, this person has a, is still going to get a lengthy um, jail sentence, there seems to be some justification in that, and so that's why it's, it's done. Okay, so it's saving time and, and money for the courts, makes it more efficient. That's the idea of it. But obviously there's a public policy concern of whether we want to do that and, uh, in criminal cases, whether somebody can plea bargain their way out of something of, where a trial would, would make them um, have a potentially a, a, a longer sentence. Right. Then we get to the criminal trial. And so um, that's a, a, um, criminal procedure. That's the basics of criminal law. And that's part one. And we'll get into part two in the next integrity session. Okay.